so my name is Ricard, and uh, as you can maybe tell from my accent, I'm not from around here. <laughs> but uh, hopefully what I have to say will be of interest to you. So the background to me being here is that I wrote three really long blog posts on why the Malaysian <laughs> education system doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So had anyone read it or like partially at least? <laughs> Right, so I'm going to try to take those really compressed blog posts and compress it into 15 minutes, roughly. Uh, I'm going to try <laughs> to give an overview of the, 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 the problems uh, that it's talking about. So that's for the background. And the background to that, uh, why I was able to write that uh, uh, analysis in a sense, is that I have a kind of an unusual uh, hobby which is that I study evil, or the, the nature of evil. Meaning, I study psychopathy and pathology, and narcissism, schizophrenia, crazy people, uh, and how they work on an individual level, and how that transfers into a societal level, whether it's groups, organizations, or nations. Uh, so when I tell this to my friends, they will you know, often ask me, like, why would you want to you know, study that, that's like dark and, and nasty, and, you, know, you know, aren't you afraid that it's going to you know, influence you, and you know, as you can tell from my skin, it's not working, <laughs> kind of a light, on the light side there, uh, so, but on a more serious note, uh, most people want to do good, and I'm assuming, sort of, you know, given the context, that you are part of those people. The problem with people who want to do good is that if you don't know what evil looks like, how do you know that what you're doing is actually good and not evil? Because even the most evilest of people, I'm going to take Hitler as the ubiquitous example, thought that he was doing the world a favor by killing lots of people. And then there's all a, a, a scale of things. But if you don't know what evil looks like, and we've been living in a civilization that has been breeding evil in one way or the other for the past 10,000 years, you know, it's really hard not to fall into the same trap. So you really need to know what this stuff looks like. Uh, so that's one thing. And the other thing that people tell me, especially if they read the book The Secret, The Law of Attraction kind of stuff, is that they will tell me, well, if you think about that stuff, then you will be attracting those kind of people to you. And my experience is that it's actually the completely other way around. When you have a appreciation of how this kind of people work and how they think, uh, it becomes relatively easy to see after a while. And you know what MLMs to stay away from, and the, the scams, and the twists, and the turns, and the, the political things that doesn't seem to make sense. You can sort of understand where it comes from, and you can sort of opt out of that. So it actually helps by understanding these things. So one of the things that I've learned about evil is that it has a couple of things that it needs. Uh, it feeds on hate, on the one person not liking someone else in a kind of violent way, either verbally uh, or physically. And hate is, has as its fuel fear. And fear, in turn, has as its fuel ignorance. And that is the connection to education. Because to not be ignorant, you will want to be educated. You will want to learn stuff about yourself, the society and the, the community that you live in, your history that you're sharing. Uh, and that will make fear go away. Because you know, you'll look at me not as, you know, as a conquistador or uh, you know, imperial white guy, but you know, another person that you can relate to. Uh, and I should say that I have uh, a partially native background. So my family has been persecuted a couple of generations back, even from where I come from. Uh, so it's, it's not all black and white, even though I'm black and my white is white. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what we would like to have school uh, as a way to keep this ignorance out from here. We would know, want to, to have school give us this kind of understanding of how we work and how history works. And as it's kind of obvious, that's not working. Uh, there's, I've, I've been shocked to see the level of ignorance and hate and fear since I came here, and it's, it's heartbreaking, uh, to tell you the truth. Um, 
And, but since I have a couple of other hobbies as well, which includes uh, history and management in orientations, I also know why that is. Because if you look at school, if you look at any public school education system, uh, where it comes from is 100 years ago. There was a guy, 1911, there was a guy called Frederick Winslow, Slate, Winslow Taylor who wrote a book called The Principles of Scientific Management. And in this book, he created the blueprint for how we run businesses. And unfortunately, you're still following that book until today, which is very, very sad. But a part of that book was the idea that uh, in the factories of the Industrial Revolution, you would have two, two classes of people. You would have managers and you would have workers. And the fundamental assumption was that the workers were uneducated. They could not think. They had no way to, to reason. And they didn't rarely did they know the language. They didn't know the language all that well. So those were the fundamental assumptions that this manager-worker system was based on. Uh, Basically, uh, so for these factories of the Industrial Revolution 100 years ago, they needed lots and lots and lots of workers because back then we didn't have you know that many machines, so there was a lot of uh, mechanical, repetitive, hard labor. So it was important that the workers of the factories were at least educated enough that they could follow instruction. So a base level of understanding was important, and that was the force that caused the public school system to be created in the first place. Before that, there was nothing like that. There were other ways to, to get educated, but that was the force for it. And because all, all of this comes from the, the Industrial Revolution, the intent is not to get people to be clever or smart or creative or whatever you would want it to be, but in the context of of the Industrial Revolution, if you have high grades, that means that you are able to take instruction and follow them to the letter. That was a grade A student. <laughs> and surprisingly, that seems to not have changed all that much. So, so, so the thing is that, that when, when, you know, when we say like the education system doesn't work, and it's like, no, it, that's, that's a complete lie. It's working perfectly. <laughs> it's, doing exactly, it's doing exactly what it's being designed for. So that is not the question. The question is not whether it's working. The, the question is more like, what it was designed to do, is that still relevant? Uh, and and you know, I think it would be fair to say that the Industrial Revolution has sort of you know, ended. <laughs> <laughs> and that we are in a very different society now, where it's more about, I think we might even have outlived the information society. That was like the 90s, I think. <laughs> and now, and now we're, we're sort of more coming to this, uh, the, the collaborative society, which is completely different, because all the rules are, of the Industrial Revolution are out the door. No longer are we working on our own, trying to figure stuff out or trying to, to, to follow some specification that our managers then would be using some targets to, to use for quality inspection. And if, and if you don't, if you follow it, you're going to get a bonus. And if you don't follow it, you're going to get punished. That, that was a hundred years ago. And, and I know that a lot of, you know, all Malaysian companies that I've talked to still do that in one way or the other. So now you know why. That's, that's basically what, where it comes from. Uh, so the question comes back to purpose. Why are we having an education system in the first place? And usually people will say that there are four basic categories of needs or, or reasons that we have an education system. The first one is the individual, uh, for yourself, to know your own history, to know the, the, the history of, of where you come from, and then for like practical things, like if you're going to go you know, shopping you need to know some basic math to be able to do that now, recently we were. So everyday kind of things that are of no use other than for yourself. That's the first one. The second one is cultural cohesion, meaning that you get to learn about the community that you live in, and you get to learn about all the traditions and the rituals and customs that you have within your community. So it's highly localized, should be highly localized. 
uh, so that you can understand where you have come from and where you're going. So there is a continuity of, this, of, the, of, of the community itself. That's the second purpose. The third purpose would be the academic, which is talked about so much now, like academic achievement. And yes, academia is important. We need to have uh, people who think about how to create new knowledge. I'm going to, I'm going to take that back soon, but, but the, the basic idea is to have academia as a way of furthering knowledge and information for the, for the sake of it, for, for the sake of humanity. The fourth one, the fourth reason is what you, most people think about to get a job. You know, for, for the professional business environment, that you get an education and you get a job and you live happily ever after. <laughs> yeah, so so that, that's how most people think about education. But the other three are equally important. And I think that the shift now is that the lines between academia and getting a job is blurry. Uh, I've been doing a lot of research the past week for my own job, and almost all of the really good papers come from other companies, like Google, for example. I'm a software developer, so all the good stuff comes from other companies, <laughs> because they are really at the leading edge uh, of my field, not the academia. So what those those are the four uh, things. So then the next question is, what is it that we should learn in school? You know, what is it that is important? And the way I look at it, there are basically three things that you can learn in school. The first would be languages. The things that we use to talk about other things. English being the most obvious one here, in this context right now, and then you have Malay or Chinese. Sorry, I mean, Mandarin or Cantonese. And then Tamil and, and a few other uh, languages. And then there's one language that most people tend to forget. I don't know why, but it's math. Math is a language. It has no purpose on its own, pretty much, apart from talking about other things. We use it for physics, we use it for economy, astronomy, we use it for a whole bunch of stuff. And that is the, mo the most important part of it is communication. So it's a language, and you need to see it as a language. Why? because it's a foundation. It's not something you learn in parallel. No, it's, it's a foundation, and it's a language. And if you don't know it, you are as handicapped as if you don't know English, for example, in this context. So the second level of things that you can learn, uh, and there's relatively few languages, you know, thank God, <laughs> uh, in any given context. Right? The next level of things that you can learn are skills. Creative thinking, creative thinking, public speaking, uh, presentation skills, mind mapping, six up thinking, blah, 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 all these kind of things are skills. Skills are slightly more of, but they are also useless on their own. Critical thinking without something to think critically about is <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Yeah, so, so, so it's it, they are absolutely they are absolutely vital as skills, but you need to apply it to something, just as languages need to be applied to something. And there's a few more of them uh, than languages, but still, you know, relatively few. Then the third thing, which is subjects, which is what you learn in school, and which is what they graded, and there's like billions of subjects. <laughs> And if you look at school as an investment of like, here, I'm going to spend time and energy to learn something, then school is really crappy as a VC <laughs> advisor because, because there's so many subjects, right? So any investment you make is going to be wrong. <laughs> and the, 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 the chance of success of, of hitting the right subject is like, you know, history, yes, I want to be a history teacher. <laughs> The rest, sorry. <laughs> so the, the point is not really uh, subjects. They're not really all that interesting. Apart from the fact that you can't learn languages without talking about something, you cannot learn skills without talking, you know, applying them to something. But it's not the something that is really important. It's the skills. What I use every week is creative thinking, mind mapping, you know, all these presentation skills. I use them every. Time, you know, all the time, right? So that is important for me. All this other stuff, 
kind of nice from maybe from an individual perspective. Important for my job? Not at all. Not even the math I learned in school is relevant at all. I have to, you know, any math I need now, I have to learn anyway because it's so specialized. Mm. And that's the thing. Subjects are a um, very high risk investment. Skills are not a high risk investment. Languages are like a no brainer because they're so generally applicable. Mm. So why are we focusing on subjects again? Moral. You know, you know it, it, it doesn't, from an investment point of view, in investing in yourself and investing in the future, it doesn't make any sense at all. So that's what I have, have to say about that. And then the, the next thing to follow on uh, logically from that is grades, right? Because that is, and that is a leftover from the Industrial Revolution, right? Because you, you're supposed to do something, and then the manager will check that you have followed the specification, and then you get like, this is how we did, and that, that feeds back to your, your bonus and your, your you know, punishment, respectively, because that's the model of the Industrial Revolution. So, uh, and there's been a lot of interesting, uh, there's been a lot of interesting research done on motivation the past couple of years. I'm not sure if you've seen the TED Talk by Dan Pink called Drive, where he explains the, diff the three levels of motivation. The first one being the basic needs, you know, food, shelter, uh, someone to uh, live with, the very basic needs, the reason why you have a job at all. Because if you didn't need that, you would like, you know, be wherever and do anything. So that's the first level of motivation. The second level of motivation is the traditional uh, sticks and carrots, right? The external motivation. If you do this, you will get this. If you don't do it, I'm going to do this to you. Right? That's, the, that's the external motivation. And that's being applied to pretty much anything. If it's in business, or if it's in education, or any context. Turns out that doesn't work. The problem is, so let me rephrase that, it works for mechanical, repetitive, and tasks that don't require cognitive skills. So if you are doing the dishes, you know, getting it to ring it if you do it fast works because that's a repetitive thing, you don't have to think, and it's like, you know, all these kind of things. But if you're doing anything that requires even the minimal amount of thinking or collaboration or any of these kind of things, the research now shows that any kind of incentive or, or punishment will actually drastically lower the performance. And the higher the bonus, the lower the performance. <laughs> Which should be kind of funny for the finance market because they have kind of big bonuses. So so when you start focusing on these uh, on the outcome, when you start focusing on the grades, what happens always, and we know this from from uh, management thinking, uh, systems thinking that when you focus on the outcome, which in this case is grades, when you focus on the target, what always happens is that people will try to game it. Always. Instead of looking at the stuff that you actually do, you will look at how can I meet my target? How can I you know, reach this number so that everyone is happy and I get my bonus? And what happens then is that you are incentivizing cheating. And the level of cheating when it comes to grades here is like, mind-boggling because you, you can say okay you, you will have the obvious ones right your know, students will be cheating a test you know, because you know, they have their cheat notes and all these kind of things and that's that's one thing but then you have the second layer which is the teachers you know you have teachers who are giving out the questions uh, the same day or the day before to, to the tests uh, you have teachers who are you know they're doing the SPM test they give the questions to their own students that kind of stuff and just the mere idea of prepping kids for a test by giving them past year's exams is cheating. What is the purpose of a test? What is the purpose of a test, right? It is to test your ability of the subject. If you're, if you're doing something that is making that test irrelevant, then the, the, what, what, are you, what are you supposed to learn from the results of that test? You only, I don't know. <laughs> so that is cheating also. When you're getting prepped, and everyone gets prepped, that is cheating. 
Then we have my favorite, which is the, 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 the new grade scheme from the Minister of Education. And I'm so amazed that no one has called them on it. Because before, it used to be, you know, like A is 1, B is 2, and uh, so on. Fair enough. You can make an average, statistically. Makes sense. Now, they have weighted it so that uh, A has three numbers, and then B has two numbers, C has one of them. So, statistically, when you do an average, it's not an average, because you have weighted the top, so it will naturally go up. Because there's three numbers representing A, instead of one. <laughs> Isn't this kind of... And that's like the MOE, which, you know, they are cheating. They are so, themselves are so stuck up in this, like, oh, we have to be better, we have to be better, that they are cheating. Thank you for proving my point. <laughs> <laughs> which basically means that grades, your academic achievement is worth absolutely this much to me. If you come to me with a grade sheet, I don't know what it means. I can't tell if you are good at it, or if you have cheated, if your teachers have cheated, or if your school has cheated. I don't know. <laughs> Therefore, I cannot make any decision based on it, logically speaking, because I study logic, because that's kind of important. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Makes sense, right? It's important to study logic. Uh, so, so, yeah, I, I can't make any decision based on these grades. Therefore, they are useless. They have no use. They have less use. Useless. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah. So that's the problem. So, so the problem with this, when you do this for a very, very long time, is that you feed ignorance. <laughs> and when you feed ignorance, you feed fear. Fear leads to hate. Hate leads to evil. And that's where you are now. <laughs> that is basically where you are now. And my point is this. The current education system, whether it's here or in any other country, is basically the same. They basically, you know, we talked about the exponential curve. It's like, are you here or are you here? I don't really care because I want to be here. If you improve the system so you get like a little better, it doesn't really matter. So what you need is not to improve it. You need to replace it. Because all the rules have changed. It's a new world. It's a collaborative society rather than the industrial revolution. We have the internet with video has changed everything. If you haven't seen Khan Academy, you need to do it. I don't know why we need teachers anymore, seriously. We need facilitators, but we know we don't need someone to do this talking more than once. I'm going to do this talk exactly once, and then it's going to be on YouTube, and you know, it's done. Right? So that's basically it. We need to find another way, and that's, this is what Wuhan talks about. We find an, uh, need another way that fulfills these four purposes for the society as it is today, with the uh, criteria that, that, you know, that we find to be important. And I think it's important to start small, because even the mightiest of oaks starts from the smallest of seeds. Thank you.